Good evening, church. I hope you all have been blessed this evening. I, I sure have myself. And I can't tell you how beautiful it is to hear the singing, the voices of this country. It's, it's really, truly beautiful. You know, in, in America, we have some good singers, but man, in Africa, you guys have some great singers. Let's have a word of prayer before we get started. Loving Father and our God in heaven, Lord, once again, we are coming to you humbly bow, asking for grace and mercy to be upon us. Father, here I am, your humble servant, asking for you to use me this evening. Father, there are many misconceptions, especially targeting this movement. In my prayer today, is that we could all be in one accord in spirit and in truth. Father, we desire to know what your word says. We desire to have the spirit of prophecy as the guide. Lord, open our eyes, open our ears, and open our hearts to what you have to say to us in these last days. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. This evening, we are going to discuss the government of God. You know... In these last days, there's something that we need to know above all things. And that's the fact that there is an enemy. And that enemy is going to especially target the body that is carrying the truth to the world. I believe that we are that body. I believe that we have the truth. However, there's much that we need to learn and much to what? Unlearn. Today, I'm going to talk about three terms that we should all be familiar with. Godhead, deity, and divinity. The understanding and the misunderstanding of these terms is what is causing division. But there is an answer. The word of God gives us insight onto what these things mean. I'm going to begin by reading Manuscript 10 in 6 LTMS 1889 paragraph six and paragraph seven. I want you to stay with me. I want you to put your thinking caps on. I want you to take notes. Okay. We may expect at any time new and startling, startling claims from Satan through his agents. And shall not the people of God be wide awake? Shall they not become strong in the strength of the mighty one? Wise in the wisdom of God? A crisis has arrived. Where? In the government of God in which something great 
and decisive must be done. The delay will not be prolonged long. The wrath of God will not be long withheld. Justice has only to speak the word, and in a moment, what confusion there will be. Voices and thunderings and lightnings and earthquakes and universal desolation. Now is our time to be good and to do good. While with wide awake senses, we watch every movement where? In the government of God with apprehension. But if our life and character is after the what? Divine model, we shall be hid in Christ or with Christ in God. The term government of God, what does that mean? We'll explore. We'll explore further. 21 LTMS, letter 162, 1906. 21 LTMS. Letter 162, 1906, paragraph 5. Listen. Lucifer was enshrouded with the glory as the covering cherub. Yet this angel, whom God had created and entrusted with power, became desirous of being as God. He gained the sympathy of some of his associates by suggesting thoughts of criticism regarding what? The government of God. This evil seed was scattered in a most seducing manner. And after it had sprung up and taken root in the minds of many, he gathered the ideas that he himself had first implanted in the minds of others and brought them before the highest order of angels as the thoughts of other minds against the government of God. Thus, by ingenious method of his own devising, Lucifer introduced rebellion in heaven. In Psalms 91, or I'm sorry, Psalms 19, let's read verse 1 and 2. In the book Christ Object Lessons, we're told this. We're told that nature is the second lesson book, right? That nature tells us of heavenly things. Am I correct? All right. Psalm 19, verse 1 and 2 says, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night showeth what? Knowledge. Now I want us to go to Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1, and we're going to begin at verse 14. Once again, please stick with me. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 14, we have the creation account. Listen to what is said here. And God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night. And let them be for signs, for seasons, and for days and years. And let them be for lights in the firmaments of the heaven to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made two great lights. The greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. 
He made the stars also. The word rule in verse 16, we can switch to govern. Are you with me? There are three things that govern the heavens. That is the sun, the moon, and the stars, right? Notice this. In uh, third testimony, testimony volume three, page 333, in paragraph two. I want you to please stick with me. This is very important. It says this, there is a lesson in the sunbeam and in the various objects in nature that God has presented to our view. The green fields, the lofty trees, the buds and flowers, the passing clouds, the falling rain, the babbling brook, the sun, moon, and stars in the heavens all invite our attention and meditation and bid us become acquainted with who? With God, who made them all. The lesson to be learned from the various objects of the natural world are these. They are obedient to the will of the creator. They never deny God never refuse obedience to any intimation of his will, fallen beings alone refuse to yield full obedience to their maker. Their words and works are at variance with God and opposed to the principles of what? His government. When you look at the stars, we see the sun, right? The sun is the brightest and most glorious body that we have in our heavens, right? Let's say the sun is a representation of the Father, right? The great light. The moon would then be the representation of who? The sun, right? Jesus Christ. For the sun gives light to the moon, and the moon gives light to the earth in its time of darkness. Are you guys with me? The lesser lights that follow are the stars, which are how many in number? Innumerable, right? Listen to what the Matthew Henry Bible commentary says regarding Genesis 1, 14 to 19. It says this, observe the lights of heaven. Observe, the lights of heaven are the sun, moon, and stars. And all these are the works of God's hand. The sun is the greatest light of all, more than a million times greater than the earth and the most glorious and useful of all lamps of heaven. A noble instance of the creator's wisdom, power, and goodness. And an invaluable blessing to the creatures of this lower world. Let us learn from Psalms 19, 1 to 19, 6. How to give unto God the glory due unto his name as the maker of the sun. The moon is the less light, and yet here is reckoned one of the greater lights, because though in regard to its magnitude and borrowed light, it is inferior to many of the stars. Yet by virtue of its office as ruler of the night, and in, in respect of its usefulness to the earth, it is more excellent than they. Now think about this. In Lucifer's fall, this is what he did. He looked at himself and said, aren't I more glorious than he? 
shouldn't I receive the honor that he's getting? Are you with me? The government of God, as seen in the Bible, are these, the Father, the Son, exactly, and the holy angels, right? Under these three offices contain the entire authority of heaven. Can we say amen? Amen. Now, I submit to you today that the term Godhead is used to illustrate this authority. You ask how so? Romans chapter 1 and verse 20. Romans chapter 1 and verse 20. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by what? The things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Once again, the term Godhead encompasses the authority of heaven. The Father, the Son, and the holy angels. All of their authority. To prove this point even further, let's go to the Review and Herald. Review and Herald, May 2nd, 1912. Paragraph 3. This is what it said. The Godhead was stirred with pity for the race. I'll give you time because I would like them to follow along on this one. All right. The Godhead was stirred with pity for the race. Who is the Godhead? The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit gave themselves to the working out of the plan of redemption. In order to fully carry out this plan, it was decided where are decisions made. In a government. That Christ, the only begotten Son of God, should give himself an offering for sin. And in giving Christ, God gave what? all the resources of heaven, that nothing might be wanting for the work of man's uplifting. What line can measure the depths of this love? God would make it possible or impossible for man to say that he could have done more. Once again, Godhead equals what? The government of heaven. The government of heaven composes of what? The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, which is what? Diffused through the holy angels, right? Now listen to this. Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6. Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6 says, For unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given. And what? The government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called 
wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting father, the prince of peace. Now, understanding that the Godhead is the full authority of the government of heaven, let's go to Colossians chapter 2 and verse 9. Colossians chapter 2 and verse 9 says, For in him who? Christ dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Christ came with all of the authority of heaven, invested in him. Amen? Amen. Colossians 1.19, why? For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. I heard the brother from South Africa mention that when it came to Matthew 28, 19, that name meant authority, right? And I agree. Matthew 28, 19 is a valid verse, completely valid verse. However, we have to get an understanding of what that meant. When you are baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, you are submitting to the authority of heaven. Amen. Amen. Now, we have a clearer understanding of God. Let's get the understanding of deity. Because in times past, I've seen the two link. Right? But if we say that Godhead equals deity, then this quote here that says the Godhead was stirred with pity for the human race, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit gave themselves to the working out of the plan of redemption, we would have to say that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are deities. Are you with me? In the Great Controversy, page 677, paragraph 3, This is what it says. All the treasures of the universe will be open to the study of God's redeemed. They share the treasures of knowledge and understanding gained through ages upon ages in contemplation of God's handiwork. With undimmed vision, they gaze upon the glory of creation, suns and stars and systems, all in their appointed order, circling the throne of what? Deity. If you go to the Webster's Dictionary, the definition of deity is simply defined as a god or goddess, period. In the book Prayer, 292, Paragraphs two and three, referring to Matthew chapter six, verse nine, this is what it says. Hallowed be thy name. To hallow the name of the Lord requires that the words in which we speak of the supreme being be uttered with reverence. Holy and reverend is his name. We are never in any manner to treat lightly the titles or appellations of the deity. In prayer, we enter the audience chamber of the Most High. And we should come before him with holy awe. The angels veil their faces in his presence. The cherubim and the bright and holy seraphim approach his throne with solemn reverence. How much more? Should we, finite, sinful beings, come in a reverent manner before the Lord, our maker? But let me ask you the question. Is the Father the only deity? No. 
John chapter 5, verse 23 says this, that all men should honor the Son even as they honor the Father. He that honoreth not the Son honoreth not the Father which hath sent him. Now look at this. In Great Controversy, chapter 5, or page 524, paragraph 2, this is what it says. Another dangerous error is the doctrine that denies the deity of Christ, claiming that he had no existence before his advent to the world. If men reject the testimony of the inspired scriptures concerning the deity of Christ, it is in vain to argue the point with them. For no argument, however conclusive, could convince them the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. In present truth, April 26, 1900, paragraph 1, this is what it says. The Father and the Son alone are to be exalted. Their holy banner is to be exalted above all the greatness of the greatest men, above all honor and glory of the world. Can we say amen? Amen. So we have the Godhead covered. We have deity covered. Now let's go to divinity. In 13 LTMS, manuscript 92, 1898, paragraph 11. This is what it says. He maketh the grass to grow upon the mountain. He giveth snow like wool. He scattereth the horse frost like ashes. When he uttereth his voices, there is a multitude of waters in the heavens. He maketh lightning with rain and bringeth forth the wind out of his treasures. These words of Holy Writ say nothing of the independent laws of nature. God is the superintendent as well as the creator of all things. The divine being is engaged in the upholding, in upholding things in which he has created. God has laws which he has instituted, but they are only his servants through which he affects results. It is God who calls everything into or order and keeps all things in motion. Let me remind you of a few stories in the Bible. We have the story of Moses, where Moses says to the Lord, I beseech thee, what? Show me thy glory. And what did the Lord do? The Lord put Moses in the cleft of the rock and he passed by and did what? Only made proclamations. Proclamations which were a revelation of his character, right? Right? And that was enough to make Moses come down that mouth with his face glowing. The term divinity is used to define the character of God. The character of God is defined as divine. Amen? Let me ask you a question. Can men achieve deity? No. Deity is not shared, is it? But let me ask you another question. Can men be divine? 
because divinity is shared, isn't it? So under, understand this. There is something afoot in the end. How many of us know that Lucifer in the last days is going to impersonate Christ? Raise your hand if you know that. What's going to make this impersonation so believable? Let me ask you this question. Are angels divine? Say it again. Absolutely. This is what is said in the Review and Herald, September 17th, 1903, paragraph 8. I have ordained that angels and men shall be employed in my work. Divine and human instrumentalities are to unite. There is a plan. The enemy has a plan. His desire is for you to not get the understanding of these terms. In Revelation chapter 13, we're going to read verse 13. Revelation chapter 13, verse 13 says this. And he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. And deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of men. Fire in the Bible has always been equated with the divine presence. Can someone say amen? When Moses was at the burning bush, the bush was on fire. The angels of God are called flames of fire. When the disciples received the Holy Ghost, it was tongues of fire. Are you with me? Here's the question that comes. Twelve letters in manuscripts. Letter 1, 1897, paragraph 10. Rebellion and apostasy are in the very air we breathe. We shall be affected by it unless we, by faith, hang our helpless souls upon Christ. If men are so easily misled, how will they stand when Satan shall, shall personate Christ and work miracles? Who will be unmoved by his misrepresentations, professing to be Christ when it is only Satan assuming the person of Christ and apparently working the works of Christ? What will hold God's people from giving their allegiance to false Christs? I submit to you today that this misunderstanding was not just sustained by us. You see, there was an instance in the book of Revelation where John saw the angel, the glory of this angel, and what did he do? He wanted to bow down. 
because John saw divinity and thought it meant deity. Are you with me? So Lucifer knows that in the end, if we don't have a correct understanding of this, we are liable to do the same thing John did. Are you with me? Great controversy. The 1888 version, 624, paragraph 1. 624, paragraph 1. As the crowning act in the great drama of deception, Satan himself will personate Christ. The church has long professed to look to the Savior's advent as the consummation of her hopes. Now the great deceiver will make it appear that Christ has come. In different parts of the earth, Satan will manifest himself among men as a majestic being of dazzling brightness. Resembling the description of the Son of God given by John in the Revelation. Now notice this. The glory that surrounds him is unsurpassed by anything that mortal eyes have ever seen. Will Satan be surrounded with glory? <laughs> Amen. Brothers and sisters, in the last days, Satan will counterfeit divinity, trying to pass it off as deity. Because he knows that you and I have had a hard time understanding the difference. And it's his dot desire to exploit that. Now understand this. When it comes to Matthew 28, 19, going back to the Godhead, Matthew 28, 19 says what? In the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Right? Which is the entire authority of heaven, which was given to who? Christ. So whether you baptize according to Matthew 28, 19, or Acts chapter 2, is there any difference as long as you know whose authority you're submitting to? There's no difference. However, there is an enemy who wants to see us fight over it. Because he knows if we're divided, you remember that body of Christ that I was talking about? The body's going to limp on. However, if we are united, understanding truth, seeing where he's trying to deceive us, he stands no chance. I submit to you today, don't let this be a controversy, for it's not. All power and authority was given to Christ. And when we are baptized in the name of Jesus or in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, you and I know that doesn't mean Trinity. So let me ask you this. If somebody was baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, but had the character of neither of those offices, what would it matter?
If someone was baptized in the name of Jesus, but walked like Satan, what would it matter? There's an enemy. And what we need to do is be wise as serpents, harmless as doves. Final battle is going to be akin to the first battle. The first battle was brother against brother, and Satan would love to see it so. Both brothers profess to serve God, right? There's an enemy who wants to see us divide. Brothers and sisters, let's be united in truth. Amen? Amen. Let's pray.